Benevolence. Benevolence. Let's talk about benevolence. Benevolence. The thing that keeps me from rest. Sometimes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. It's not so a bad what thing. is benevolence? Soft enough. That's a funny word. Benevolence. Yes. Being good to people. Yes. Showing being favor. Benevolent, giving being nice to gifts. Being, be, be good. Let's be a good church. Nice people. Mm -hmm. We give. Oh, we give. We're God, God nice. is benevolent to us. Nice. We're benevolent to others. Nice. Nice. Is an interesting word. Yeah. I don't know if I like nice. Just looking up. Are we supposed to be? Nice? You should try nice sometimes. Should do we? Yeah. <laughs> should we be nice? Uh, it's nice. Be gentle to all. It, gentle. The quality of being well-meaning, kindness, benevolence. That's kindness. kindness, benevolence. I think that's good, but nice. I think sometimes we confuse niceness for doing what's good for people. Nice. That doesn't hurt someone's feeling. Pleasant, agreeable, satisfactory. Okay. Um, agreeable. Yes. It's not agreeable when I tell my kids, no, Yeah, you're going to burn your hand if you put it on the stove. <laughs> yeah. Dad, but it looks so fun. So here's the thing. So this summer, while I was on sabbatical, somehow my email got, what would you call it? It's not hacked. It's like mimicked or yes. scammed or fished or yes. that's like the technical term. So, so what people can do is basically the technical thing is that if you somehow someone got access, and I think this happened to a number of churches in the area. Kind of, yeah. access to like email lists, mm -hmm. right? And you can identify like who is the lead pastor or who is the main chief communicator or whatever. And they could have done this any number of ways. And like, we don't even know how it happened. We do know multiple churches has happened. Okay. So they got a list of all the contacts that, that are in some kind of database, right? And um, they know who is the pastor. And then they had this system where Instead of actually coming from your email, they use what's called the email headers, mm -hmm. which is metadata. It's unseen data that says, even though it came from something, something at Gmail, uh, make it look like it came from... Right. Right. Living uh, Hope. Yeah. Living Hope. So, or they actually just did, they copied your email address and it was like at gmail.com. Yeah. It was like yeah. off by a couple of things, yes. but it looked like it was from me. Yes. Uh, and then I remember getting an email yeah. from you saying that uh, there was this great need of someone in the church and you wanted me to help you. Yeah. That I was supposed to get a bunch of, um, uh, I don't know, gift, gift cards. cards. Yeah, gift cards. And to uh, and to not let anyone else know about yes. this. Yes, Because it was very clear that the person who was in need, uh, <laughs> right, this this needs to be, yeah, just between you and me. And then to email you back once I bought X, you know, $250 yeah. of gift cards. Yeah, so there was another one along with that one that said something, there's a matter of great importance, please call me right away. So on my, I'm on my sabbatical. First of all, I wouldn't be, I was hardly on email at all. At the very beginning I was because I was clearing up some things, but then I was, I was vowing like, don't even go on email. So people are getting emails from me or look like it was. Um, second of all, I'm on a sabbatical and now I'm starting to get, texts and phone calls from people like pastor i got your email you know how can i help or they were saying i got this email from you that looked funny and then my wife started getting texts from people because they were like i got this thing from blair is that even true so the good thing was i got to talk to some people at yeah. church yes yeah. you know and being away most of the time i didn't get to talk with them so i was like hey how you doing that was good um but then it brought up this thing that maybe in the purpose of the podcast, maybe our people don't know what we do for benevolence ministry around here. So we can talk about that. But I would like to say, if the church were to ask for help, it would not be me contacting you as an individual and saying, hey, psst, keep this quiet. The senior pastor wants you to get some gift cards. That is a total scam. And that's very shady. I would never do that. Um, on um, one part, but the second part is I wouldn't need to do that because we have a benevolence fund at the church that's already in our budget. Plus, people give uh, special gifts and you know, out of their own volition throughout the year. So that's the thing is that if you're part of Living Hope Church, you're already giving towards benevolence. Yes, mm -hmm. so we would never ask you, yeah, right, to give to a need because as a church we have a big chunk of our there. budget for missions, and we also have. We, we, we got money for benevolence mm -hmm. and what we're able to do with that as a church is actually care for people and to help people who really need it in a way that is helping them yeah. not just, yeah, just exasperating the problem. So some things that we've done this year for benevolence, 
Yeah. Um, we have helped some people pay, people from our church, mm -hmm. pay for some kind of real important bills, like a gas bill to heat their house. Yeah, keep their utilities yeah. going. And keep so someone's house from foreclosing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we helped somebody um, just with, with groceries, um, just basic needs. We've, we've done some gas cards for, for people that, that have needs, things like that. Um, and I think that's important because what we're trying to do, and you two are the main overseers of the benevolence ministry, I'll tell you a story about that in a little bit, but what you're, we're trying to do is, you know, within the church family, and I think there's a scripture, it's either Galatians, I'll have to take it up, or First Peter, but doing good within the household of God you know, take care of each other because we have, uh, well, let me just ask a question. Why are we more prone to helping those that we know versus people who might be a cold call off the street? What's the philosophy behind that? I'll tell you a story from India, a church planner that I was working with. We would meet maybe once a month uh, with a group of other church planners. This guy, the only, his only possession that he used for planning churches in remote villages was a bicycle. He loves Jesus saw multiple right groups of disciples gathered and start into these, these distant villages and he would ride his bike every evening and his bike got ran over by a bus so when i met with him for we were about to have this meeting he met with me before and he said brother i need to get out to these villages and my, my bike got ran over by the bus and showed a picture of it and all this kind of thing and he's such a trustworthy guy i believe him it would cost 60 dollars. i mean relatively $60 in U.S. currency to get him a new bike. I had 120 in my pocket and I said no. And I prayed for him. And then we got together with a bunch of church planners, right? And we had our meeting and we discussed where, how our church is doing in health. And then one of the issues all these pastors said is like, we were struggling with generosity. I struggle as a pastor being supported these new believers, they need, they need to be taught to give and steward it well. And then I said, okay, well, how did Jesus do it? And I had them search the scriptures. They came to this conclusion from the Bible, right? Actually, we've been doing it wrong. People were giving us the money and we were putting it in our pocket where Jesus actually had someone, Judas, right? Who dealt with the money. Jesus never dealt with the amount of money. There was transparency. And so we need to do that. And I said, we should probably also practice generosity too. They're like, yeah, we should just practice it. All right, so appoint two treasures. They appointed two treasures. Now what need do we need to address? And so everyone shared. And then eventually my brother, my friend said, what happened to his bicycle? And it became clear to absolutely everyone. This is what we should, this is what we should support. Mm -hmm. And he's with tears in his eyes, tears in his eyes. The money was gathered right there and I contributed, right? But God provided everything. And, but if I just gave him that money, he would have lost out of the blessing and the community and the growth and the encouragement mm -hmm. that clearly came from God. He would have lost out and the people, all the other leaders would have lost out. Mm -hmm. They get to care for their brother that they've been laboring alongside by side with. I think it's, it's, it's kind of connected to the rest idea, uh -huh. the rest idea in the sense that we feel the need that we have to be the solution to everybody's mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, that ultimately benevolence is helping somebody in like empowering people. And so that story also illustrates kind of what you're talking about, the need to have a relationship. I think the more closely connected you are in relationship, the more data you have. Mm -hmm. and the more understanding you have and the better you can help somebody. Yeah. Right. So just to illustrate it this way, a guy's holding a sign along the street, right. And you feel like, okay, he's, he's got a sign that says, you know, he needs money mm -hmm. for, for food. And so, okay, what would you advise in that situation? Well, I would advise, get to know him, ask some questions, gather some data, try to assess how you can best help him. Because at that point, then you can can provide a solution that's appropriate for the need that he really has. Mm -hmm. But what we make the mistake a lot of time is we don't know the situation. We just throw money at it. You could have just thrown money at the bike mm -hmm. and 
we don't always make the right solution or, or, or offer the right mm -hmm. solution. So, so people in our church, we know better. We have a relationship. We can better address and assess the need. So we should prioritize that mm -hmm. because I think it's also a question of stewardship. Um, and so we try to steward that well. Yeah. I think it exposes this. Uh, we have a weird, we have a weird way of saying wealth in the West. We see it as money, liquidity, uh, liquidity, mm -hmm. like what you can purchase, what you can do with your money. It's very materialistic. But the, the truth is, is that I think in the kingdom, the most richest people are the one who have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And just as Jesus promised, right? Right. Um, you will lose family. Anyone who would be willing to give up mother or brother or sister for the sake of the kingdom will receive a hundred times more in this life right. mm -hmm. and eternal life that the gift is relationships that God brings you into a family that actually gives a rip about you and actually cares about you. And the biggest gift, the, the way you invite people into actual wealth is to invite people into a relationship with the family of God and with God himself. And when you have that, and when you're able to get over yourself because you're really living in the gospel of grace, and you have a desire of extending forgiveness and generosity, when you're in that community, you are more secure than anyone else you can imagine. So practically, somebody has a need. What do they need to do? How do they get help from our benevolence fund? Yeah. How can we help people? Yeah. So on our website, if you go to livinghopefamily.com slash help, there's a form. If you come in person, we also have a form available and it's just a initial contact you put in your information. One of the questions on there that's going to be very important is that what is your connection with Living Hope Church? I believe we say something along the lines of, we are a community of faith. We're not a support conduit. We support City Mission, um, uh, Christian Clearinghouse, a lot of organizations that do uh, specified, specific, right, uh, needs. But as not a support conduit, but as a community of faith, we believe that the best way that we can help people is in connection and relationship with our church. So we'll ask you, are you part of our church? Do you know anyone who's part of our, our church? Because maybe you're not a part of our church and you need help, but maybe you know somebody because uh, we actually have you check a box to say that you're open and willing for this need to maybe not be met by, you know, the church staff, but for other people who actually are connected with us to journey with you in it. And we don't do it like, there's no bad reason why we do it. It's just, we know what actually can help people because just, I don't know, just here's, here's the guilt that a lot of people go through. When you really look at poverty, you realize that there is injustice there are a lot of people who are just with the system, their background, they just didn't have the means and they've just been trampled all over and they're treated like a doormat. Mm. In response, out of guilt, we would feel bad if we don't let someone potentially trample on us because they've never had, right, anyone give them what they need. We feel like we cannot say no even if what they're asking for, we cannot know in good conscience if it's really going to help. And so by not saying no, what we actually communicate to them is, is a message that I used to get this all the time when I worked at the homeless shelter would, it would be a message that you're incapable, you're incompetent, you need me. So I'll be your hero. I'll be the solution to your problem. And that it was subliminal. It was, it, yeah. they didn't, we didn't say that, yeah. but our actions communicated yeah. that. And so it reinforces, I am stupid. I can't do it. I can't. Yeah. But a relationship of coming alongside of somebody to be able to really help someone and and call them to 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 maximize their their image of God, the the, yeah. the their humanity. Like you are capable. You have dignity. You have value as a human being. And so, how about this question? Say I'm somebody at Living Hope Church and I want to help somebody, but I really don't have the extra margin in my budget. Would we be open to them coming to us saying, hey, Pastor Dave, mm -hmm. I really want to help this friend. I, I know they're trying really hard. Yeah. Would we as a church be willing to partner if I walk along and journey with them? Yes. Would we be willing to, to give some money to that person to work with them? 
to to address a benevolent issue. Those are the situations that I think we would be looking for. Right? It's kind of like uh, being a lizard instead of a frog. A frog waits around, right, for someone to come to them. I got a need and a sob story, and it's like gobble up all those things and just spend your money by the first person who has a lizard like goes after opportunities. So, <laughs> hey, if we have if we have benevolence budget, which we do, we want to be proactive in stewarding it, right? And so we need to be on the move looking for opportunities to really help people in ways that are not just material but spiritual and those connect in relationship. And so the only thing I would just say for the person who may if you know someone in need is that you can't just hand off the relationship to me, right? Or to us, mm -hmm. right? You, God has already roped you in relation to that person. And so we can help, the whole body can help in maybe the areas if there's a financial need, walk with them and then let us, right, help in some of the areas that maybe if it's not the time or if it's not the finances, we can, we can help that. But we want to do it in relationship, in partnership. So those are the sort of things I know it's really hard I think relationship is hard. Um, it's really easy to try to go off and ask for help where nobody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to fight against that and and preach against that because it's bought into this false gospel, right? That if I'm not pulling myself up by my own bootstraps and if I'm not self-sufficient, then I'm something less than. Mm -hmm. And we feel good about being the savior, yeah. saying yes to the person the underdog, always been trampled. I get to say yes to you and I get to be the provider. I get to be the benefactor and I get to be the giver. Yeah. But if you do that enough, you can never ask for help. And that's why I, I struggle with the word nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it, it just in my mind, it's connected to that, like that belief that I somehow am going to solve the problem. And no, I think that that is not the case though. Okay, how about this? Can, we, can I be nice and needy at the same time? Can I be nice and needy at yeah. the same time? I'm needy and I'm nice. No, I'm like, does that make nice better for you? Because <laughs> it's not like it's not like I can always just be nice and just give people what they want. And see, I think the niceness. I don't know if I understand your question exactly. I think the niceness is from the benefactor. Yeah, they yeah. want to be nice. Yeah, um, I'm agreeable to help you. Yeah, with so, your but I need people to be nice to me too because I'm fragile. Yeah, and I'm weak. I see. So I'm, that person isn't always open to a challenge. Like, hey, you can do this. Yeah. You can address this issue. So let's sit down and talk through your budget. Yeah. Because I believe that you have the the the, the, means. the wherewithal mm -hmm. and the, the ability to steward what, what you have. And we could rearrange some things and we'll give you some money to get in the right direction. But I'd like to talk to you about Sometimes people are fragile. They can't, yeah. they can't hear that. So I, it is a weird way of saying, yeah, nice and needy. But I guess it's, 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 the, it's this reciprocal. There is a mutual care, mutual accountability, mutual encouragement that happens. It's weird. It's like even in discipleship, it's not like it doesn't flow one way, right? Generosity never flows one way. Right. Even if you're sitting with someone who's down and out, they actually have whether it's it's in their head, it's in their mind, they have the connections already. They have the wherewithal already. They've been beaten down, they've been denied, but it's already there that you can, that you actually need to help them, right? You're helping them figure out what they already have. And then you can give some too, right? And it's the idea of everyone has different spiritual gifts and everyone has been given different things, but the loving one another, serving one another, being generous to one another, I need something from you just as much as you need something from me. And as brothers in Christ, helping someone with benevolence is just in community figuring that out. Yeah, I think about Galatians 6, 9, and 10. I found what I was referencing earlier. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we'll reap, a, uh, we'll reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of ho the household of the faith. So what I appreciate about what you guys are talking about, because I think of another couple of examples within our church of people who are helping people like maybe get their high school diploma or helping them get connected with a job. So they're coming alongside them, encouraging them, saying, yeah, here's the steps that you can take to better uh, your particular situation. And that's done in love. It's done in friendship. It's done in relationship. It's done in care. But when we're connected within the church, a lot like biblical counseling, 
um, there's a there's this whole uh, swirl of things that happen: relationships, prayer, accountability, encouragement, uh, reciprocal learning from each other, instead of uh, the cold transactional type thing too. So, I th- I like the direction that's going. So, well, well, that's the pit or that you guys are is is seeing the me. church as some kind of institution. Yeah, instead of like a family. family. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy, and I think I think you know. I think people, there's some people, it's, it becomes obvious if you try to reach out for help and you see us as an institution, right? Call the office, share your story, mm-hmm. and then cuss me out. Right? When, when, <laughs> when you I, say no. When, what, no. Not available. Not when I say no. Mm-hmm. Cuss, cuss me out when I invite them uh-huh. into community yeah. and to really like the wealth that they really need mm-hmm. is that you can profess to be a believer, but Man, the, the greatest thing you need, you need brothers and sisters who actually are walking with you in your life. Yep. If you're not willing to do that, then it's not that we're not willing to help. It's that that is the way we can help. Yeah, that's good. That is the biggest thing. It's not yeah. about money. And it gets to the root of the yeah. heart of yeah. the matter. And so if you're listening and you're like, how do I know if I should help somebody or not? I just would encourage you to just start asking questions, get to know them invite them into community if they're reciprocal and then they're responsive to that that's great mm-hmm. like that those are the kinds of great opportunities that are really i think meaningful and can really be a lasting um change and opportunities to really help somebody mm-hmm. there's two resources i can't help but say do it uh, do it live tree resources <laughs> well, when to when helping hurts and yeah. toxic charity are two, not necessarily, um, I wouldn't call them great exegetical, like mm-hmm. deep biblical, uh, you know, but they're written from kind of that Judeo-Christian perspective that I think they get at the heart of what we're talking about, where we're talking about calling people into community, mm-hmm. calling them into relationship. Mm-hmm. And so... I would say uh, I've read When Helping Hurts. I think it's really good. It it, it will deconstruct really, really well. Mm-hmm. I do think what's missing from yeah. that book is a little bit what we talked about. That 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 kind of more this redefinition of really what wealth is. Yeah, it's Jesus even talked about it. Yeah. It's like, hey, I don't want to beg. I'm just going to forgive people all their debts. And Jesus is like, that guy's shrewd because mm-hmm. now he's got places like. How much more you have you have wealth in heaven yeah. mm-hmm. so that this idea of actually it's really faith community that's the only that's the only solution i have it's the only thing we can offer really yeah um so but yeah if you read that book you'll you'll walk away going like oh apart from like micro loans that are like really well managed and that like management there's high accountability and it's really diffused and diversified i don't think i can do anything charitable it's not true right and mm-hmm. so so the moral of the story is you will not be receiving a phone call, an email, or a text from me that says, meet me in a parking lot. No gift Somebody cards. at church needs gift cards. Oh. Don't tell anybody about yeah. it. So if you get an email from us, it will have <laughs> at livinghopefinley.com. And if I really, if we really need your help, I'm going to call you and you're going to hear my voice at the other yes. end of the line. But yes. that that hasn't really ever happened. So I don't anticipate it will again. So yes. <laughs> and, and Prince... Abubu Abujal is not <laughs> is not what is to give not five million dollars is not the crown prince who's disposed <laughs> who just needs a little bit of your money. Oh, that's good. All right, amen. Hey, that was fun. See you guys next time.